Hey guys, it's Piper, and today I'm going to, as requested like a million times, finally review and analyze K-12. through But I'm going to do it in pieces so my channel doesn't die because I could easily talk about it for hours and bore everyone to tears because I love it quite a bit despite its flaws. So let's start with a disclaimer. I'm no expert. I have never written a screenplay longer than like 10 pages. I sold my Sid Field screenwriting guide so I could buy a sandwich. And I couldn't find a copy of the screenplay for K-12 through online, so when I talk about Melanie's writing, I'm not gleaning anything special that no one else can see. Uh, I'm just assuming she stayed as true to her own vision as possible with her budget, which is quite the asterisk, as we'll get into. Today's video is actually sponsored, yay, by our musical guest, Little Kumari. Stay tuned for a preview of her song, Social Anxiety. So for the two people watching this who don't know, K-12 through is the title of both Melanie's sophomore album and the accompanying film. Melanie describes K-12 through as a surrealist dark comedy musical. It wasn't an easy road for Melanie, as a lot of you may have heard by now. She spent over a year on the screenplay and produced enough material for about three hours of runtime, only to have to cut it down to size so she could fit the initially generous-sounding budget Atlantic left her with. The budget was twice what she asked for or thought she'd need, but it turned out not to be high enough to produce the movie as she envisioned it. She then had to cut the film down to 88 minutes, excluding the end credits. Furthermore, the album itself had about 47 minutes of runtime. Again, not counting Fire Drill, since it's not on K-12, through the album, leaving her with only about 40 minutes of runtime to tell the story she wanted to tell after every song was accounted for. That may sound like a lot, but in movie terms, that's, that's not enough to tell a really long story. Now, this took a toll on the screenplay, in my opinion, as the story she wanted to tell was incredibly ambitious. It had a large scope with a wide time frame, Crybaby's senior year of high school, from day one until prom night, and most importantly, it had a ton of characters in it. The unfortunate result was that she didn't get as much time to focus on all the characters as she wanted, I'm sure, and, you know, all these last-minute cuts and fixes also made a lot of the transitions between scenes sync up kind of awkwardly on the first watch. Though on my second watch through, it made a lot more sense. So, you know, it wasn't abysmal by any means, and it does work. But since you have to watch it carefully, it, I suppose it's not ideal. A lot of people say they were confused by the transitions, and I encourage you to re-watch it after watching this video if that's the case. It really does help, and I will be explaining it in a bit, the plot, so the more I watch it, the more I love it. Personally, uh, if I had to cut something down from my guesstimate of 270 pages to maybe about 88 pages, I would throw out the whole project in a rage and vow revenge on every man, woman, and child who I encountered on my way to the cave I would spend the rest of my life in. Going down in history as a spiteful cryptid. They would say, to this very day, you can hear Piper calling from their lair. Curious souls have ventured down there to ask if they're done with book two yet, but none have ever returned. But Melanie tried her best, and I think she succeeded for the most part. At first, I thought the scenes she decided to include were strange. Like, at best, they were just ghostly inklings of the story she wanted to tell, and we had to infer the rest, or perhaps at worst, they seemed random. But then I realized that the whole film is, much like her songs and music videos, a huge metaphor. In this case, K-12 through uses Crybaby's adventures in her boarding school as a metaphor for today's political climate in America. The description of the film is, A girl and her best friend embark on a mission to take down the oppressive schooling system of K-12 through with the help of the magical friends they meet along the way. Metaphorically, I would argue that this story is actually about modern-day Americans breaking down the oppressive patriarchal government we grew up in to make the world a better and safer place for all, and I think the scenes that Melanie decided to include are a huge hint to that. You see, most people analyzing the film have already noticed the parallels between Donald Trump and the song and video sequence for the principal, but they tend to stop there, not noticing that the movie as a whole is all about America, in my opinion. Let's take Miss Harper, for example. Melanie says she was supposed to get a satisfying ending in the longer version. Like I said, she had to cut a lot of characters down to size, but she still decided to include Miss Harper in the film. In the film, Miss Harper was immediately dismissed as soon as she's introduced, though, so one may wonder why bother to include her at all. It's because she isn't just a character. Metaphorically, she represents every transgender person in America and their struggles with employment and transphobia. By extension, with the principal representing current President Donald Trump, what we're actually seeing played out is Donald Trump's unfair views and legislations against trans people like the military ban. So this scene is not so much 
the introduction of a character, but the introduction of an important element. Melanie is fleshing out the school as a stand-in for America. If you look really closely at all the conversations Crybaby has with her friends, most of them aren't about light topics usually tossed around in teen movies. Their discussions serve to reveal problems in America and the American education system, such as the inaccessibility of tampons, sex education being confusing, censored, or non-existent in schools, and bullying. So while the plot itself is rather sparse and a lot of things are left to be implied, for example, Crybaby's father being a ghost that she can channel, and Kelly staying at the school, if I interpreted this correctly, what Melanie is trying to do is deepen this metaphor of the American government and, by extension, the Department of Education. For teens, problems in the education system, like the inaccessibility of tampons and being sent home because their outfit is too distracting, to boys will be more on the forefront of their minds. For adults, we're likely thinking about rigid expectations women have to follow, such as highlighted in Drama Club and, and Trump's corrupt fist on our country. Though the beauty of it is, in today's information age, American teens are becoming ever more conscious of injustices in the government on their own, and adults do remember what it's like to be a teenager. So this film has a wide amount of appeal to everyone, I'd say, especially American women. Since the education references are fairly direct and not as metaphorical, I'm going to serve a more political example. One character refusing to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance mirrors multiple NFL and NBA players who have refused to stand for the national anthem, an inaction against what Donald Trump has since called a civil duty. This refusal to stand was done to protest racism and police brutality in a political climate where a lot of people are losing morale. Similarly, the student in K-12 through refused to stand because liberty and justice for all is bullshit, in his words. The owners of the NFL voted unanimously in favor of a new rule that would fine teams whose players kneel during the Star Spangled Banner, after which Trump suggested players who refuse to stand, quote-unquote, shouldn't be in the country. He has also previously stated that these players should be fired. Despite refusing to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance being a peaceful protest that merely shows the lack of support for the oppressive ruling class of K-12 through and perhaps the country as a whole, it is responded as a threat to their power. The student is whisked away and drugged so he can be a model student, smiling and conforming through all the torment. The staff also forcibly doses Crybaby, which suppresses her magical powers. Crybaby and her friend's magical powers are perhaps also a metaphor for any power the oppressed has over the oppressor. However, these powers are important for another reason and I will discuss them in more detail in a future video. What's important is, in the end, the power of the ruling class of K-12 through is artificially found in numbers and motivated by money, whereas Crybaby's power is internal and achieved because she's fighting in the interest of the underdog, who incidentally has them outnumbered. Though the principal's son is able to trap prom goers in a recessed dance loop for a few minutes, his inability to keep it in his pants is what leads to his downfall. When faced with the truly powerful, a brief distraction is all it takes to dismantle the whole system. All this comes together to make it all the more satisfying when they escape the school and send it off in a puff of pink smoke, like we can live vicariously through them as they evacuate the school finally free from all the torment. Or maybe that was all a load of bullshit, but that's my interpretation. Hope you like it. Because of the relatability, I think this film has a lot of potential as a cult classic. That and the dances are really good and the cinematography is beautiful and of course, obviously, I love the songs. So while the film isn't perfect, as if, not that anything can ever be perfect, but you know what I mean, there's still a lot to enjoy about it and it is groundbreaking in its own ways. I feel confident that if Melanie had more time and resources, we would have had better character arcs and a more clear plot. My favorite character is actually Kelly because of how fleshed out she was and how complete her character arc was, and I plan on analyzing her in more depth in the future. I hope Melanie continues to flesh out this world, as I'd love to see what happens next. While I finish up this painting, please stay tuned and listen to Social Anxiety by Little Kumari. People who skip go to jail.
friends, that is. I go out sometimes with, like, new people and stuff, but, like, it's been a while since I could really call someone, like, you know, my best friend. I used to have one. I used to have a best friend. Um, I get so jealous when I see best friends, like, and at the same time, I get so happy. I get so happy for them because when you know that they have each other's back, and that's just so beautiful to me. Like, that's so beautiful. I wish I could have that once again. I'm alone. They can't see. They think it's funny to be sad like me. I'm alone. They can't see. They think I'm weird so no one talks to me. the song please check out lokumari's socials links will be in the description and in the top comment pinned so um, please comment for the algorithm subscribe and share it with your friends so i don't starve to death in a cardboard box and blessed be motherfuckers <laughs>